The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, so we're going to talk about uh, China and the internet in Africa today, and it's one of the topics that, of course, has been a theme of our coverage this year. Uh, earlier in the year, we talked uh, with uh, Huawei's chief spokesperson for sub-Saharan Africa, Adam Lane. We've been bringing up this issue a number of different times, in part because it is one of the main sticking points between the United States and China in their ongoing dispute. And so we think it's so interesting to be able to take this discussion broader now from looking from the telecommunication side into the politics of it all. Because the technology space in Africa is changing faster now than it has probably over the past 10 years, in part because of deeper Chinese engagement. Let's just refresh a little bit where the Chinese are in the African ICT space. Uh, so in addition to being the primary hardware network hardware provider, Huawei, of course, uh, is reported to have built 70% of Africa's 4G networks. They're also building the connectivity. They're building the new Huawei Marine undersea cable that's coming. Companies like Transcend Holdings and their Technophones uh, now have some um, about 50 to 55% of the market. And now the big Chinese e-commerce companies are coming into the market, Alibaba, Tencent, and some of these bringing their logistics and their delivery expertise and all of these different things. So the presence of the Chinese tech scene in Africa is big and getting bigger. But Kobus, I think the concern that people have is not for the delivery of music and services, but really about is the Chinese political model coming also into Africa with regards to the tech space? Yes, this has a, a lot to do with um, what has come to be called the bifurcated internet, you know, idea. The idea that that the, the global internet is going to be split into zones, like domains of influence, um, with you know one domain of influence being being a kind of a U.S. led um, so called quote unquote kind of free internet, and then a, a Chinese led more centrally controlled internet with the the related narrative that that will then. Uh, facilitate government surveillance or higher levels of government surveillance of citizens. Um, you know, it, it raises a lot of questions about Africa's position in it because, you know, what we see in Africa frequently is, is a lot of Chinese network provision, but I don't know that we so far see as much use of Chinese apps, for example, or like Chinese platforms. Um, so, so Africa is a big question in relation to the bifurcated internet. Um, and the role of African governments particularly need a lot more attention. Well, let's delve into this. And the timing couldn't be better for this because there's a brand new book that just was published over the past few weeks, China, Africa and the Future of the Internet is written by our old friend of the program, Ingenio Gagliardone from Wits University and Oxford University. And he joins us again on the line from Johannesburg. A very good afternoon to you, Ingenio. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me again. It's wonderful to have you back. Congratulations on the new book. Just a heads up, everybody. Uh, the book that we're discussing today is available for sale by Zed Books. It's also on Amazon. Hopefully it'll be there. Uh, and we'll have links to the book so you can, after this discussion with Eugenio, go out and buy it because this is really, really super important. I think, Eugenio, a good place for us to get started is just give us the broad overview of what you found in your book. I mean, it's a big title, China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet. How are those three concepts linked together? Right. Uh, you're, you're right when, when you pointed the title. I thought at the beginning when we decided with the editors uh, uh, for China, Africa and the future of the Internet that it could be a bit grand. Uh, but what has been happening just uh, in the past few months, uh, uh, you both refer to the insistence of the U.S. government on uh, banning Huawei, at least from their closest allies uh, in, uh, in the U.K., Canada, Australia and so forth. Uh, and is showing that actually this very big game is being played right now. And Africa is one of the spaces where we will understand uh, uh, in which direction the internet is going. Kobus uh, rightly pointed out that this idea of the bifurcated internet, uh, 
And uh, I remember Eric Schmidt, uh, the former CEO of Google, uh, uh, pointing that idea a few years ago, and uh, and it sounded like uh, um, a bit too pessimistic and a bit uh, bleak. But what I have seen in the past few years uh, is that it sounds like a self-fulfilling prophecy, and uh, it seems that it's not simply simply something that some pundit, uh, some uh, experts, some competitors uh, thought it might happen. Uh, it seems that there are a variety of actors, including in the United States, uh, that are actively trying to make it happen. So it seems that really the battle for the kind of internet that we are going to use in the next few years uh, is uh, uh, starting to be fought. And uh, when it comes to the why I wrote this book, and the origin was just this sense of like impatience uh, towards uh, um, the many, I would say, especially Western scholars or, uh, or uh, activists uh, that had already decided that uh, any influence coming from China in the internet space was going to lead to more authoritarianism. And realizing that uh, very few of these people have actually done empirical work. So that was very much the starting point, trying to get real evidence from the ground. And I chose a number of countries that had sort of played well into the scheme and to actually see what was happening rather than having our uh, presupposition and stereotypes uh, guiding uh, our judgment of what China is actually doing in Africa. I found it very interesting, you know, in reading the book that you made the decision, you, you, in your case study countries that you chose, you chose between countries with, with kind of more democratic or more um, liberal kind of um, approaches to the internet and more centrally planned or more authoritarian approaches to the internet. Can you talk us through the countries you chose and, and what, what you found in, the, in, the, in their different cases? Yeah, this was key in the design of the book because uh, as uh, you both uh, said, one of the the fears that are uh, put there in the public domain is that uh, China is going to promote an authoritarian version of the internet. So what I decided to do is just picking up two countries that are deemed authoritarian. One is Ethiopia, the other one is Rwanda, and two countries that, as you said, Kobus are more uh, uh, liberal-leaning or more democratic according to uh, international standards, Ghana and Kenya, two countries that also have embraced the ICTs as a way to rebrand themselves. Uh, and see what was China actually doing in these uh, countries. Uh, and the result was, was fascinating in a way, because we could, uh, I could see, and uh, on the ground, something that you guys on these programs and many other scholars have been saying for a long time, China doesn't really have a template approach, and uh, it tends to uh, fit, even in the case of telecommunication, into the scheme that is being created uh, by the countries in which China is doing business or is developing relationship. So what I've seen that uh, Ethiopia is very unique, and even if it's changing fast because of Abiy Ahmed, the new, the new prime minister, and uh, Ethiopia has this very stubborn project uh, of uh, expanding access to telecommunication and a regime of monopoly, and without a juggernaut, a big supporter like China, this could have never happened. And uh, China has come forward with the largest loan in the history of telecommunication in Africa, more than $3 billion to allow uh, the Ethiopian government and tele telecommun state-owned telecommunication to do exactly that, to expand access in a regime of monopoly. But then if we move to Kenya, uh, China has behaved very differently. It's a very liberalized, very open market, uh, and Huawei and ZTE have just become one of the many players that are actively operating uh, to expand uh, uh, the telecommunication sector. So there is a lot of, lot of difference. And, and the, probably the most striking case is uh, Rwanda. Rwanda is arguably one of the countries that has the closest similarities with China from a political point of view. Also, the apparatus of surveillance that has been developed is very sophisticated. Uh, and you know what? It wasn't China to support the, the expansion of telecommunication. It actually was South Korea. And because of longer-term relationship that the Rwandan government has developed uh, with Korea Telecom. So we have a lot of diversity in, uh, in this space that doesn't really support the idea of uh, China exporting authoritarianism in Africa. It's interesting you say that because that really goes against the grain of a lot of the reporting that we've seen. Uh, it, earlier this year, the New York Times did a really uh, great piece from Ecuador and really showing how Chinese surveillance and ICT and all of the, the apparatus behind what China's doing here is now being exported there. 
and and there in the, being not just in Ecuador but also in other countries around the world. So particularly in non-democratic or countries that are struggling with democracy. But it sounds like you're discounting that a little bit. And, and I'd be interested to hear why, because there is a lot of evidence that supports the idea that China is exporting uh, the technology and the know-how to train governments and telecom operators on how to use this technology for less than democratic uh, reasons. Well, my intention in the book and more broadly is definitely not uh, defending China or uh, arguing against the evidence. Uh, but one of the main points that I'm trying to make is that it's quite easy to point the fingers at China. And if we simply do that, uh, we may lose uh, a more complex, uh, but more even scarier picture of what the internet is becoming in Africa. An example that I use in the book um, is that uh, because of this Northern Re Revelation, we now know that the Americans, uh, the NSA, have been training Ethiopian spies uh, in using surveillance technologies. And we go back uh, uh, more than 10 years. Because of a very good work done by the Citizen Lab, our colleagues in Canada, we now know that the Ethiopian government uh, has been purchasing software in Europe, uh, in uh, the UK and in Italy, to spy on political opponent. And as we just discussed, uh, uh, China has uh, supported the expansion of the telecommunication system in Ethiopia. So we have this kind of very unique situation where if you are an Ethiopian spy, most probably you have been trained by the Americans to use some software produced in Europe to harvest data on a Chinese bill network. And this is the real picture that is emerging, where China is definitely one of the players but sometimes uh, the pundits uh, want to keep the high, a higher moral ground, showing what China is doing. Uh, but this is hiding the many responsibilities uh, that are coming uh, from the West uh, and from many different other countries. Uh. You also did very interesting comparisons um, about uh, the kind of language that that authoritarian African governments use in justifying things like surveillance. Um, and I wonder if you could t tell us a little bit about that, to which extent they actually draw on Chinese ideas of, of why surveillance would be useful. Right. In this case, I have seen, uh, I would say, a multi-layered picture. So it seems that out there into the public domain, uh, it's very dangerous to uh, point at China as an example to follow. That can happen in the case of uh, developing the economy or the industry, but when it comes to the media and telecommunication, uh, it would be a big risk to say that China is uh, the example. Uh, the only person I had on record so far was uh, Robert Mugabe, and uh, a few years ago when it still was president in, uh, in Zimbabwe. At the same time, uh, uh, engaging with a broad variety of actors uh, and journalists, uh, people in government in the countries that uh, we, we mentioned, but also other countries, uh, there has begun to, um, uh, you can start seeing a kind of a quest to kind of unpack uh, the Chinese model. So it's still true that China publicly is not trying to promote itself as a model to follow, but a lot of people are starting taking notes. So when it comes to the public domain, a kind of easier argument to be made, especially by uh, leaders in authoritarian regimes, uh, is to exploit an agenda coming from the United States above all, which is uh, the anti-terrorism agenda, and saying that uh, if the internet is being surveilled uh, or is shut down temporarily, is because there is a risk of destabilization. There are forces of uh, evil or terrorists that need to be uh, checked and controlled uh, uh, for the kind of uses that uh, they are doing off the internet. So as I try to explain in one of the chapters in the book, uh, there is this kind of unholy alliance uh, where on the one end, discursively certain measure, surveillance, the shutting down of the internet, uh, appeal to the securitization agenda that is emerging from the West. But then when, we, when it comes to actually implementing the hardware and also in some cases the software to uh, control and surveil, China is definitely one of the partners. It's interesting because I, I just finished earlier this year a book that came out in, uh, in 2019 called Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, who's a New York University professor. And it's absolutely fascinating. I really think it, it really mixes very nicely with your book. Uh, because in the West, or in the United States in particular, 
we talk about the Chinese in the context that we are free, but the Chinese are exporting surveillance. And yet, Shoshana Zuboff in this book talks about how Google, Facebook, Amazon, and the others are in the business of sucking up all of the data about an individual. And now we look at that and say, well, it's not the government, it's not, you're not being imprisoned for it. But at the end of the day, in some ways, you are having to make compromises about your life. So the news you get, the information you get, the opportunities, your jobs, all of these different things are, are now being driven more and more by the algorithms. So it's one form of surveillance or another form of surveillance. Now, we also know from the Edward Snowden papers that the NSA and uh, various government entities were tapping into the big surveillance capitalist companies, that is Facebook, Google, and these others. So I guess I'm curious when you kind of talk about these issues with people in the United States and Europe who are very, very eager to talk about civil rights and the promotion of human rights and are critical of the Chinese, do they have the self-reflection that surveillance is also an issue in their communities, in their countries? You're absolutely right. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm trying to argue uh, in the book is, uh, is geopolitics uh, in uh, 2019 um, and could have been also in 2015, but not uh, 20 years ago, is distracting. So this book is a book about geopolitics. It's China, Africa, and the internet. Uh, but one of the, the, the attempt, one of the goals is just uh, getting geopolitics right to open uh, new spaces. So I try to be, to be a bit clearer. Um, rather than uh, focusing on pointing the fingers at China or at others, I think looking at the new power dynamics that are emerging on the internet uh, would be much more helpful to understand where we are. Uh, so uh, the, the, the initial mythology of the internet was just this free space uh, when someone in the garage could create a, a completely new model of business or uh, revolutionize the way in, people, in which people speak. And that, for some time, was very much true. And since in 2019, the situation is very much reversed. So we have enormous uh, powers, uh, enormous, enormously powerful actors. Uh, they could be uh, private actors, the Facebook, the Googles, and the Alibaba and the like, uh, and uh, increasingly powerful states that have taken notice of the importance of the internet, uh, which are colluding at some level, as you just said, uh, both in China and in the US as elsewhere, and they are very much limiting uh, the ability of individuals to be in control, uh, obviously of their own data, but in a way also of their own future. And, uh, and I think this could also be seen as a, as a window of opportunity. During the Obama administration, the US was very much uh, branding itself uh, as the good guys, and the Chinese were seen as the bad guys. And that's a uh, kind of rhetoric, even if it was like, uh, uh, hiding a lot of complexity was sort of believed in, in many places around the world. Now, with the Trump administration, there is no more, guy, no more good guys. And it would be a great opportunity to sort of go back uh, to some of the, uh, the spirit at the origins of the internet. Uh, and rather than pitching China against the US, uh, having uh, epistemic communities imagining an internet that is free from these enormously powerful actors uh, and can be reinvented, at least a bit of it, uh, from below. Yeah, that's a very interesting issue. And I mean, it's something that you see a lot in discussions about something like Instagram, for example, where, you know, there, there's pe people use it as a form of self-expression, but at the same time, it is, you know, very, very stringently controlled. Um, you know, and then frequently self-expression means finding a way around some of the central control tweaking it in some kind of way. It's, it's a very interesting issue. Um, one of the other, you know, kind of communities um, that, that you know, that play a big role in this issue in Africa is, of course, African governments. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've dis on, on this podcast, we've just talked a lot about African agency. Um, and I, I, I assume that, yeah, I, I think that there's a way of reading your book to, you know, that that, um, that would come out very much on the side of, like, so I see African, Af African governments have a lot of agency in relation to China, you know, because essentially what they ask for, they get. You know, if they want more authoritarianism, 
you know, then they can buy the tools to to achieve that from China. And if they want a, a, a multilateral liberal, you know, kind of marketplace, then they can facilitate that through Chinese technology as well. But is that an oversimplification? Like where where do the where does the pressure lie on African governments and what can't African governments get even if they want it? Well, also in this case, it's a kind of a uh, layered picture because, uh, as you said, and the, the case of Ethiopia we just discussed uh, shows how uh, a powerful agent, the Ethiopian government, was able to kind of mix and match different pieces of technology to achieve the goal uh, that they wanted to achieve. Some are coming from China, others from the US, and others from Europe. At the same time, a feeling that I had uh, in many of the interviews uh, uh, in all of the countries, I can't really single one out, uh, is that the big picture is not clear to anybody. Uh, the sense is that China is one of the many players and there is a sense of gratitude also among uh, um, some computer scientists and entrepreneurs that China has uh, uh, taken an interest uh, in the telecommunication sector in Africa, is empowering them in a way, also in negotiating with uh, uh, older actors. Uh, at the same time, nobody really knows what's going to happen next. And there is the sense that uh, even African uh, governments, which seems to be pretty powerful agent when they deal with China, also in this sector, might lose control uh, later on. And uh, the tools are not there to really decipher what the grand plan is. Uh, and that kind of suspicion lingers, uh, and nobody so far has been able to come up with the, an with the answer. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Your book is focused on the future of the internet. I just want to see if we can step away from the inner a little bit, internet, and look at the role, the bigger role of technology. And one of the issues that a lot of people are concerned about is China's export of facial recognition uh, software. And earlier, I think it was, what, 2018, Cobus, there was uh, a, a deal signed between Z the Zimbabwean government and a company called Cloudwalk. And Cloudwalk is one of the major Chinese uh, surveillance companies and facial recognition and artificial intelligence companies. There are some others called iFly Tech is another one, Hick Vision. And these are all part of this new generation of super powerful, very, very large, very sophisticated, using artificial intelligence, big data, machine learning, all of it put together. It's what the Chinese surveillance state is actually using uh, here in China. So, and now they want to bring it into places like Zimbabwe and other countries. Now, Zimbabwe signed the deal, and, and then afterwards, once they learned that the uh, data from all of this was going to be sent back to China, and it really brought up this question of who owns African consumer data. It's a very, very pertinent issue now, in part because all that Facebook and Google data, guess what? That goes back to California. And so where is the agency and the... Uh, you know, the ownership of African data, are the African governments who are, are they getting their act together to build the data privacy laws, to build the data ownership laws, much like what we're seeing in Europe? Or is this going to be a free for all? And the big giant tech companies from China and the US are going to basically devour African data and keep it for themselves. What's your thought on that? Well, the case of Zimbabwe is fascinating. I wish I could have included it in the book, but uh, I didn't have time. My, my, my publisher wanted to to have the book out sooner rather than later. But uh, I think together with Huawei and 5G is one of the examples that China is already playing the next game. And at one level, it seems that uh, what is ordinary in terms of technology, 4G, or in terms of how we uh, have access to services, uh, uh, fingerprint recognition or uh, uh, passwords, uh, is, is a game that China is not playing, is not really playing the next one. And I think a lot of the fears, and I would say even panic in the US, uh, is also motivated by the fact that some people have figured that out. Um, so I completely agree with you. I tend not to frame China as uh, 
neo-colonial, I never use this, this, this term, or exploitative. Uh, but in the case of the data, is really a kind of a self-serving uh, uh, um, um, uh, attempt to uh, improve uh, their algorithm uh, by including a whole variety of faces that you can't really uh, find in China, at least on a mass scale. So there is uh, a lot of criticism also of uh, uh, algorithmic bias, uh, and Google has been put on the spot uh, uh, for it, uh, for its inability to uh, recognize uh, uh, certain faces as compared to others. And, uh, and China is harvesting data to be ahead of the game. And, uh, and when it comes to laws, uh, and uh, uh, Africa is very much, again, I'm trying not to, to, to fall into the stereotype that Africa is behind, uh, but uh, when it comes to this kind of protection of privacy, there is very little. And there are some colleagues of mine here at WITS, one of them is, uh, is Keith Breckenridge, uh, who made uh, in, uh, in, uh, in some of his work a very interesting point uh, on how the lack of regulation in Africa could actually be an advantage for experimentation. And uh, um, if you take the case of uh, Somalia, uh, a country at war, a country where the government is unable uh, to, to, to secure uh, vast areas of the territory, there are some of the most fascinating cases of drone being used to deliver goods. And one of the things that is preventing drones from being used elsewhere in the world is regulation. And there is a lot of problems with privacy. You don't want a drone flying over your head or you definitely don't want a drone next to an airport and so forth. In Somalia, these problems don't exist. And because of that, a group of very smart Somali, they came together and say, well, people are scared to deliver uh, valuable goods uh, using roads. Well, let's use drones. And now it's thriving. And uh, there are so many other examples like these. So I think it's, we, as I said before, we live in an age, in a moment of great opportunities. Uh, we, we need to just change our perspective and say like, uh, our uh, lack of laws is simply uh, making us more vulnerable to this big player or can we actually use the lack of laws uh, to create innovation and be very creative about problems uh, that are common for many people in Africa and they can't be solved uh, uh, by uh, external players? How do you see the bifurcated internet issue playing out in Africa in the future? Um, you know, as as we as we mentioned, there's there's you know there's a lot of Chinese networks being put in. Do you do you, do you foresee that actually you know leading to actual Chinese influence in internet use as a whole in Africa? It's interesting. If you had asked me this question like a few months ago, I would have said like, uh, no, it's not really going to be a problem. But these uh, uh, Huawei rift. It's scary, and, uh, and it's scary in a way as uh, um, some other scholars that you also mentioned uh, in the show or in your Twitter feeds have, have explained. Uh, uh, Huawei is somehow forced to play a different game. It seems that up to a point, uh, Huawei had no interest uh, to uh, uh, develop a bifurcated internet, uh, and uh, with the very strong... Uh, um, um, uh, request coming from uh, the Trump administration to the UK, to Canada, to Australia, to not just not uh, uh, um, going ahead with uh, with Huawei, but even rescinding existing contract, uh, uh, a war is being created where there was no need for one. And so going forward, I may see as a defensive strategy more than uh, as a uh, uh, as a proactive way to, to impose the standards on Africa, while we're going into the direction of a bifurcated internet. But again, I think this is a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, some are saying that this might happen, and they also create the connection, the, the condition, sorry, for these uh, to happen. So this is very much a space to watch because I believe that in the next few months, even uh, uh, things will will uh, happen very rapidly and a new direction may be charted that will have a, a long-term uh, influence uh, uh, going ahead. Eugenio is absolutely right. These things are happening very, very fast. In fact, this is really one of the first books that's out there that tries to step back from the, the rapid pace of, of news and developments on it. China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet. It's available on Amazon. We'll have the link in our show notes. You can also buy it in some bookstores. 
Uh, it's on Zed Books out of South Africa, so it may not make it all the way around the world in the print version, but certainly the digital version is available. Ingenio, again, congratulations. We really appreciate you taking the time. If people want to follow uh, what you're reading and writing, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Well, I'm a bit intermittent on Twitter. You know, the surveillance captain is, is a problem, as you, as you said. <laughs> the irony and, uh, is not lost, So I by hide the and then reappear <laughs> occasionally. But uh, my Twitter handle is my name, I-G-I-N-I-O, with an E a at the end. So, Eugenio E. Ingenio Gajardone is at Wits University and Oxford University, and again, the author of China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet. Ingenio, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you both. Kobus, I was a little surprised to hear Ingenio be more benign about the the more fearful parts of China's export of technology to places like Africa. Again, the Western narrative, particularly in the United States, is one where Huawei and Hikvision and Cloudwalk are exporting terrifying pieces of technology, which they are. That New York Times article was fascinating and very, very scary. But at the same time, uh, maybe that's not the whole story. And I think, I mean, obviously, Ingenio is one of the, the most well-respected experts on this, and he's looked around. And I did appreciate the fact that he said that the United States, Europe, Israel, South Korea, there are a lot of players in this market who are exporting technologies and training people to do things which really go against the grain of democracy. So I think when we step back and look at this, the Chinese, we need to hold them account and accountable for what they do. There is no doubt I am not trying to let them off the hook. But at the same time, Eugenio made a very good point that we have to really take into account the other players in the market. Yeah, listening to him is actually even scarier, actually, for me, because because there are so many players um, involved, um, all working to you know to strengthen the hand of government, um, sometimes in sinister ways. But then you know, so many of them are coming from countries that see themselves as completely democratic, um, and as players that you know, as 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 forces for good in the world, which I think, in a way, in a weird way, makes it harder to then point out, you know, that some of these companies, what, what some of these companies are involved in, you know, like with, with China, you know, there's so, there's so much kind of, um, so many people are looking for, for the, the kind of bad side of the China, of the expansion of Chinese technology. Um, but so, so, so many fewer people are actually looking you know, for, for you know, around lo looking at kind of negative impacts of, say, South Korean technology in the world. You know, so so it's it's it actually in a weird way, it's, it's it's really disconcerting. So two books that I recommend again that pair very nicely. It's like a wine and cheese thing. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff, Surveillance Capitalism, excellent book. It really again talks about the role that the big surveillance capitalist companies that make their money by sucking in all of our data and then selling that. Uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you name it. Uh, those are all of She focuses on American companies. Another book by Kai Fu Lee, AI Superpowers, really discusses the role of the next generation of technology that, uh, that Ingenia was talking about, artificial intelligence, big data, and whatnot. And he does talk about what happens in Africa, which is a little bit scary. I can't say that I agree with what Ingenio said about the lack of regulation. Uh, he said it can be a positive. It certainly can be a positive. But I suspect that the fact that African governments will likely not keep up with the technology, as we've seen governance shortcomings in other areas of, of society, it, it's unlikely that they're going to be progressive in this field just because it's hard to keep up with this space. And I fear that, it, that, that these big companies will take advantage of that in less than democratic, less than nice ways, in ways that will ultimately compromise the African consumer. Uh, whether it's on a political realm with what the Chinese are doing in surveillance or in a commercial realm with what Google and Facebook are doing with people's data, at the end of the day, I think without a very, very strong regulatory framework, uh, they will get uh, – people will suffer. Yeah, no, that's 100% true. But at the same time, I mean – 
you know, countries with, it's not like countries with strong regulatory frameworks are necessarily, you know, escaping some of these effects, you know. Um, some some of the countries with very strong regulatory frameworks are also places where where these these companies are are located, um, you know, kind of where they do most of their work and where, where surveillance capitalism as a kind of massive business model evolved. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for governments generally, I think, but it, I, I agree with you, I think it's going to be particularly hard for African governments. Yeah, and not just Africa. I think developing countries around the world, South Asia, South America, Africa, and parts of the Middle East as well will also be in this as well. So that'll do it for this edition. We'd love to hear what you think of Ingenio's point of view. Again, go out, buy the book. It is something that's part of the discussion that is only going to intensify. This is not an issue that's going away. Africa, of course, is a continent of young people who have been raised on technology. And with bandwidth now expanding on the continent in massive ways, in large part due to projects like the Huawei, Huawei Marine undersea peace cable that's coming from Pakistan. Uh, the Chinese are instrumental in this. You cannot separate China from African technology. Those words go together, and they will always go together. So there's good, there's bad. We'd love to hear what you think about it. You can email Kobus and I directly if you want, eric at chinaafricaproject.com, or you can reach Kobus at kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. Also, don't forget we have a fantastic newsletter that goes out every Monday. If you'd like to sign up for that, just go to our website at chinaafricaproject.com. We'll put you on the list. And basically, Kobus and I pick the top five to ten stories of the week. Uh, we put a long read there from a scholar or a think tank. And, uh, and then we have a nice little cute quote of the week that goes in there. So it's a nice little digest of the top news if you're not that intent on following China African news too closely. So we really recommend that. We would love to, to hear from you. We'd love for you to get engaged with our community. And of course, to join us again next week for another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.